Madam Chair? Yes. Whereas the Falls Church Public School Board has convened a closed meeting on this date pursuant to an affirmative recorded vote and in accordance with the provisions of the Virginia Freedom of Information Act, and whereas Section 2.2-3711B of the Code of Virginia requires a certification by the school board that such closed meeting was conducted in conformity with Virginia law, now therefore be resolved that the Falls Church Public School Board hereby certifies that to the best of each member's knowledge, one, only public business matters lawfully exempted from open meeting requirements by Virginia law were discussed in the closed meeting to which the certification applies, and two, only such public business matters as were identified in the motion convening the closed meeting were heard, discussed, or considered. Second. Okay, sure. Good. Mr. Ankuma? Aye. Very good. Thank you. Mr. Castillo? Aye. Ms. Carney? Mr. Lawrence? Yes. Mr. Sharp? Yes. Ms. Ward? Yes. Mr. Webb? Yes. Thank you. Hi, I'm Pete Davis from 608 Highland Avenue. Uh, I've been involved with the school system for 20 years since enrolling in Miss Zafras' kindergarten class in 1995. And sometime around 2025, I hope to enroll my firstborn in Mount Daniel as well, so I'll be involved for another 30 years or so. Uh, and so I'm taking the long-term perspective when I talk here uh, about the direction we're heading. And uh, I wanna comment here today about how we can realize triennial uh, plan priority 1.3, which calls for an increase in real-world project-based learning and participation across the community in a way that ensures our schools' civic education catches up with our technological education. Uh, Martin Luther King was wise to point out that we've learned to fly in the air as birds, we've learned to swim in the seas as fish, yet we haven't learned to walk on earth as sisters and brothers yet. Uh, we call, he called on us to close the gap between our technological progress and our civic and moral progress. And part of a school's job is to teach us technical training and the use of modern gadgets like laptops, but another part of a school's job is to provide students with the habits of civic thought that inform them on how to steward that technology. An understanding of technology led to the polio vaccine and the moon landing and in a much less remarkable way, personally to me, helped me build our city's largest technological hometown product, which is the Falls Church Commonplace. But an understanding of, technological, of technology also encoded the formulas of subprime mortgages and the practices that are boiling our planet and the bombs that are being dropped on Middle Eastern villagers as we speak. So technological education taught students all of those things, but only civic education can help students tell the difference between the life-affirming and life-destroying uses of them. So I've emailed the superintendent and the school board multiple times throughout the school year uh, on getting the ball rolling on civic education on the scale of digital education. Parents almost unanimously, when you called on their voices, they responded, we want student-based learning, project-based learning out in the community. Community service is not enough. We need a civic education agenda. And I've received message after message from students and alumni in support. Uh, yet, you keep kicking the can down the road. You haven't even, one, given us the courtesy of meeting this year about responding to this public sentiment that you asked for. Uh, and two, you haven't even informed the public about a point person who is leading the district's civic education efforts. 
and this lack of care for the type of education that public schools were founded on, civic education, uh, is not in line with Falls Church's civic heritage. It's not in line with the public sentiment of students, parents, and teachers. It's not in line with the great work of middle school teacher Rory Dippold, who won two Agnes Meyer nominations for his civic education work. Why not copy it across the school uh, system? And it's not in line with the gravity of the civic crisis that you see if you glance at a newspaper or TV at home tonight. False Church deserves better, so I call on you to publicly designate a point person in the administration to start and lead the conversation on civic education revitalization so we can get this ball rolling. Digital education has gotten its due and is now revitalized thanks to your work. Uh, it's time for civic education to have its due. Uh, it won't involve as many expensive shiny new apples, but it will assuredly be just as, if not more, fruitful. Thank you. <laughs> have a good one. Thank you. All right. Uh, next, recognitions and reports. Um, Dr. Jones, do you want to summarize this and then I will take, I will have the pleasure of awarding it. Yes, we were invited to receive an award at VSBA and we didn't know what it was for actually. It was a surprise and it was recognizing all of the wonderful work that Mr. Kane has done for Falls Church City Public Schools on behalf of our Healthy Meals program. And we were absolutely delighted to be there. And so we've invited him tonight so that we can give him his uh, due honor and his diligence in saying thank you, Richard, for all that you do for making sure that our children have healthy meals, making sure that all children have meals. And I know I was working on the report that you had sent me in 2,000 meals in the summer. Uh, is amazing for a very small school division. So thank you for all the work that you do. And we want to say congratulations on this award. It's really yours. Uh, we got to bask in your glory. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Jones, and thank you, Richard. Um, I do want to say that. Um, the City of Falls Church School Division was the only school division to receive this award, so this is quite prestigious for us. Um, it was given to us, it was presented to us by the First Lady of Virginia, the Honorable Mrs. McAuliffe who uh, asked if we would please invite her to our school division this year to learn more about what we're doing with Healthy Meals for Children. And so I asked Dr. Jones to be sure to um, work with me and with you to extend that invitation to the governor's wife and to have her come and see all the wonderful things that we do um, from Husky Meals to, uh, to Healthy Meals. So congratulations. It was, it was so fun to be in front of that whole room and be recognized for the good work that you and your staff do. Just a quick point. Uh, this is not the first time uh, for such an award for Mr. Kane and the food service program. Uh, I believe it was in 2012 that uh, we received a Magna Award from the National School Boards Association uh, in recognition of Mr. Kane's efforts for food service and uh, that was received in the uh, NSBA convention in San Francisco. So thank you for doing it again. Yeah. Awesome. All right, those things are always really fun to do. Um, next is uh, item six, the consent agenda. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda as presented? Second. Thank you very much. Uh, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Um, Mr. Ankuma, Mr. Castillo. Uh, any opposed? All right, thank you very much. Um, 
Moving along to uh, business items. First is uh, item 7.01, first reading of a variety of school board bylaws and policies. Dr. Jones, or is that Mr. Horn? Who's oh, going to help please us please allow Mr. Horn. <laughs> 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 All right, I'm going to see if I have all of these open without. Uh, without Wi-Fi, but um, because it's first reading, I'm not going to um, read the policy for you, but rather explain real quickly um, the rationale and what generates uh, a change at this time. Um, by law, yeah, I think I'll be okay. Uh, Bylaw 2.23, uh, you know what, I might need you. Hold on a second. Thank you very much. Close this one. Uh, the, uh, the question from at least one of you about why we need the additional language in 2.23 um, is that we don't because we operate in a manner that perhaps doesn't require this language. This is a suggested language um, from the VSBA, and many of our policies don't follow the suggested VSBA policies precisely, um, and this may be one of those cases where you decide that this language that has inserted just one year after the allowing of electronic participation under the current guidelines, what you see in black is new as of a year ago, um, this one was added because some board was somewhere in Virginia was deciding that they would elect electronic participation or not based on who you were or what issues were on the table, and that's no longer allowed. So the question is, do we need it in our policy to ensure that future boards will not make this decision based on who or what is on the agenda? I'm going to pause between each one of these yep. and give people a chance to ask questions or give feedback. Anybody have anything about this? I, I just have one question since there are seven of us. And, and how would you not know who was asking? What, 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 how would you anonymize this? I, I don't think you can. Um, the, although I don't know that it's asking that it be anonymous, I, I believe what we're suggesting is that the board must indicate that it was made without regard to who was missing. And obviously, we have to specify who asked to participate electronically, so the denial of that would indicate also who asked and who was denied the right. It just says that the board can't. Can't always say, John. we don't <laughs> like John, so John can't, can't participate <laughs> electronically. Maybe only but John can Margaret do it. Margaret can, yeah. right? I mean, I think that's what this is getting at, right? Is that's right. You can't you can't say you can't do it just because you're that guy. That's right. Okay. Kindergarten. <laughs> right. <laughs> okay. And, and so do we have to make a finding as to why we rejected it? I mean, it just seems kind of silly, frankly. Yeah, I understand. Right. Um, the, if, if you reject the request, you would make a finding with specificity, and that is actually Virginia code language. So if you determine that John cannot participate electronically, the minutes would show why. Right. And they, what they would not say is because it's John we don't or because him. there are certain matters on the agenda by which, under which we would want John here. Mm -hmm. Okay. So um, if I can just take a, a real quick one. Does anybody feel strongly this needs to be in our policy or do most people kind of agree with Justin that this is a little bit more than we need? I. I Unless we have to have it in, I don't think we need it. I think we're all adults. Anybody um, demand it to be in? I, I don't think it's a bad idea because we aren't always going to be on this board. <laughs> and it, I think um, moving forward and re, um, refining this, um, I think it, I personally like it. I like the language. Um, okay. Michael, what do you think? I'm with John. Um, if it doesn't have to be, Okay, thank you. Kieran or Lawrence, do you have any objection to removing this from this policy? No objection. Thank you very much. So I think this one can strike him. 
quick question. Ma Madam Chair, could I just maybe add one suggestion? And, and that would be even a statement that it's our intention and expectation it would be allowed, frankly, because, you know, it, it seems if somebody shows up, they would be allowed. Um, maybe that's unnecessary too, but for the future generations of school board members watching this, I think you should be allowed to participate remotely. Well, that's what this policy is about, is allowing you to do that in the policy process for it, so I don't think so. So, next. Okay, we'll scratch that. Um, 8.27 uh, is in response to new code language that um, uses e-cigarettes or classifies e-cigarettes as also prohibited. Um, the policy applies in two different places, one in the student section and one in the personnel section. The question about when does it apply, it applies in all of the same places that cigarettes applied. So the question about is it on campus, off campus, in vehicles, uh, on school grounds, the answer would be if it applied for cigarettes, it would also apply for e-cigarettes, the prohibition. So I, I sent in a, a bunch of comments on some of these, and one, one question was, so would this apply to field trips, overnight field trips? It Could does, they... and, and the, the, the phraseology you're looking for there in 9.37 is school-sponsored events, which don't have a start time nor a stop time when they're away. So it's, if we are overnight in a hotel on a school trip, you're still on a school-sponsored event. And that, and that is consistent with student code of conduct and student handbooks in, in each of the schools as well. Thank you. Are there other questions? Anyone? Just, just one question. Do we need to define what an electronic cigarette is? Because I know it's elusive. Is it defined somewhere else? It is, it is defined using the Virginia code language. We can include the exact same language. Um, it's not included in the VSBA, lang v VSBA language, and part of that is because it becomes restrictive at some point as those things change. Mm -hmm. Okay, then if it's defined somewhere, that's fine. Great. Okay, sorry, just one question. Where is school oh, sponsored? Excuse me, but the, chief, you're supposed to, the chairman has to recognize you, you and oh, Robert's rules of order, so please. Is there any question, John? Yes, ma'am. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, where, where does it say school sponsored event? 9.37. It does not say that in the in personnel 8. section. Okay. Two seven. Okay. Thank you. All right. Any other questions about this? All right. Very good. Mr. Horn, next. Eight point two nine, uh, child abuse and neglect reporting. Um, this is cleaning up language that um, is long, long ago. It, you can see there it previously said that by two thousand and eight, um, we are now well past that deadline. Um, the question about do we have a interagency agreement, um, it is wrapped up in the, in the Falls Church and Fairfax Comprehensive Services Agreement uh, and our use of through the Fairfax Falls Church Community Service Board. So there's, there are agreements, but ours comes directly through the city. The city feeds through Fairfax. Um, we have a unique situation. If we were the Fairfax County School Board, we would have a, an interagency agreement with the Fairfax County Human Services Department. Because we are in Falls Church, we, the city, excuse me, the city is the party to the comprehensive services agreement in this case. All right. Um, Zach, did you have something you wanted to say about the prior policy? because as an experience with the team as a teenager I've actually heard a lot about their use uh, among other people and it's just kind of alarming because uh, how little we know about them and how much of a I thought they do pose so I'm actually really glad that this change was made and, you know I hope we continue to oppose them as a body in the future thank you I'm sorry I didn't see you to call on you earlier I no problem. okay 8.74 uh, again, the Virginia Code changed to require this to be become part of our policy manual. Uh, the question is expressing milk or feeding. The code language is specific only to say expressing milk, which means that it should not be interpreted to mean feeding. It uh, doesn't mean that in a school setting we wouldn't accommodate. It just means that by policy this is what we are required to do. Does that help? 
Sorry, Madam Chair. Are there any questions? Thank you, Matt. Um, the other question is, um, who's an employee? Would this apply to subs and other people, or is, is it going to, or certain adults in the building going to be treated differently than others? No adults in the building will be treated differently, nor students who are in this situation. Right. Uh, yeah, it applies to students. Okay. Thank you. Any other questions? questions? Yes, Mr. Ankuma. I'm just curious by the age of one. It's interesting. You, if you decided to remove that that uh, that piece of it, you would not be the only school division in Virginia to do so. Some have adopted the policy without the restriction of the age of one. But that's the code language it says now. Virginia code says at the age of one. Some school divisions have adopted it without that restriction. Wouldn't state law preclude our policy? Yeah. I mean, no, we are required to allow it to one. We, we would be allowed be more to require it beyond. Yeah, we couldn't say six months. Yeah, okay. But we could go a year and six months, or we could just remove one altogether. All right, that's fine. Any other questions? No? Okay. Um, does anybody have an opinion about this age one business? I, I just, I'm just wondering why it's capped at one. If, if a mother wants to go beyond that one, that's right. all I'm asking. I, I feel the same way. I mean, I, I, I mean, it, at least a year is healthy, and I'm not going to get into the medical aspects of this. But um, some people do um, feed their children breast milk until they're three, four years old. Um, I don't think we should uh, impose our beliefs on our employees. <laughs> um, all right. Just me. Sounds like we strike that time. Strike the one year. Sounds like it. Yeah. Yep. So for second reading, that piece will be removed. Yep. Very good. Uh, nine thirty-eight removes the nine point three eight removes the um, previous age uh, and grade restriction for carrying and using self or medication prescribed to the student. Um, the the question about the is that a good thing? Um, it lies in that the, both the parent and the medical prescriber have indicated that the child is of the age and maturity, supposedly, um, to self-administer in these cases. The previous designation of ninth grade may have been a bit arbitrary. There may have been eights that could do it and tens that couldn't. I think what the intent here is now is that we have both the medical prescriber, not just giving the medicine, but indicating they can use it in school and the parent consenting to this dosage being available at school. All right, um, any questions about this one on this end? No, any questions on this end? Madam Chair, yes. just, uh, there's a typo. It's uh, the first bullet. It's carry with him and use. 31, right, line 31? Yep. We get it. Okay. There's also one in line six from the previous version of the policy <sighs> that we will yes. fix as well. <laughs> All right, anything else on this one? Very good, thank you. And finally, 9.63? 9.63, um, the significance is that it adds to our concussion management protocol, uh, not just return to play, but return to learn. Um, this is an easy one in the sense if we were to give you an impact statement, this is something we've done for years, so it doesn't change our practice in any way. Um, but Virginia Code did change to require this of all school divisions, even though we were already doing it. Um, the pertinent question is that this policy is specific to student athletes and it is specific to students who suffer or, or um, the injury occurs while participating um, in our athletic program. The policy doesn't apply to a student that's injured outside of the building. It doesn't apply to a student who is injured in the building but not in athletics. It doesn't mean that our practice doesn't and I, I can share with you that, that the practice does treat all the same. Our return to learn protocols are implemented without, just without regard for whether you're injured here or there. The difference is how do you get into the pipeline? A student athlete is injured um, and they get into the pipeline via this policy. A student who is not a student athlete is injured and they are entered into the pipeline via prescription from their medical provider. Um, we don't have a school board policy governing students with concussions. We have one governing student athletes with concussions because we're required by law to do so. Um, but we have a practice that treats them both the same. Anyone? 
questions, concerns? Yes, Mr. Lang. Thank you. Um, Tom said that because I asked because it seemed like we were not, to a certain extent we were saying we didn't care if you, you know, you fell at home, you got a concussion, we, we didn't have something for you. Um, I mean, it seems like in practice we do. It doesn't matter where you get it, um, how you get it, as long as the school knows. And, and it's, you know, the burden on the kid and the parent, but as long as the school knows, the school will take the appropriate action to help you get back into whatever, not just um, back into sports. That's correct. And, and if the board wanted us to explore the step of creating a policy that would imitate this but apply to those who are not student athletes, we could certainly do that. Um, and we would do it with, again, no impact because we're already practicing it. Uh, this policy went in in 2011 and has now been updated specifically because of code uh, catching up to the practice of schools that were already being proactive. Right. So would you, what would your advice be to us about the upsides or downsides of us having a separate policy that would cover students who have concussions but not due to being athletes at our school is that something we should do would given, there be given my current that? level of confidence with our practice uh, I, there are very few downsides to creating a policy that would cover all students again because we I believe we effectively can today already do that um, okay Madam Chair, I, I, one yes. question is would we need a separate policy I mean do, do we have to have one for student athletes and then if we wanted to broaden it or could we have one that would include student athletes but it wouldn't be specific to I, I, I would have to confirm the answer before I gave that one mm -hmm. to, to see what it is that we are required by code to say specifically has to do with student athletes there are pieces of this that must apply to student athletes and some of what we have would not apply to students um, mm -hmm. primarily the pathway in and uh, who is the approved medical provider and who's not. Um, so we would want to do a little bit of an impact analysis for our current staff. Um, for instance, we would want the policy to be reflective of who on our current staff might be and who is not in a position to be called a qualified medical practitioner for this policy piece. Okay. So it would not be a straight imitation of this one. Mm -hmm. Right, but in effect, you could have a broader concussion policy with a subset being specific to athletes and another subset being specific to we could we could amend else. nine point six three to include students probably more easily than taking nine point six three and opening it up would amend it for a specific student section. It says these aspects of nine point six three also apply to students who are not athletes, something mm -hmm. along those lines something but like I, that. I would I would request that we would have until November first reading to amend it in, with that much of a significant change. Right, that makes sense. Yes, Mr. Castillo. Well, I'd, I'd say two things. It seems as if we would have three buckets: the students already covered, student athletes doing travel things, and then students who get concussions. Um, so I think we should maybe think about that. I, I would also say, from personal experience and knowledge, the the non school athletes um, accommodations have been excellent and, and you know have worked well. I don't see any reason why we can't, shouldn't do something to expand the awareness of what concussions are to deal with and, and accommodate those students, so. Okay, thanks. Does anybody object to us asking Mr. Harn if he would take, we'll take this off the first reading tonight and ask him to go ponder this and come back to us at a later date with something that would be more comprehensive to cover all students, anybody object to that? No. Nope. Okay, why don't we do that? Does that make sense? <clears throat> Am I allowed to make an alternative suggestion? Absolutely. <laughs> My alternative suggestion would be to leave the new red language as it regards, as it relates to return to learn protocol in, because okay. we're required to offer that to student athletes by Virginia code as of now. As of now, okay. So we, we leave it in, we adopt the policy as is, but we will review 9.63 again in November, so October 2nd reading, we'll pass it, we'll review it again, either with an amendment for students or an entirely new policy, 964, in November. No, that's fine, I just didn't know there was a drop dead date that we had to get this passed, so we'll leave it, it in It is tonight. a now one. Yep, so. okay, that's great. Thank you. Simple. Very good, thank that's you so it. much. Thank you. 
All right, so now we have a motion before us to approve the first reading of these um, policies just discussed. Is there a motion? Should we, Madam Chair, are we, is a motion to approve them as amended because some of them were not, were to be taken out or others? So what will happen is we have to go through two readings of this. Oh. So we're going to approve the first reading tonight. We've given Tom some feedback. He's going to go do his magic. And then our next meeting, he'll come back with amended ones, which we'll approve on second reading. If that night we make further little tweaks or amendments, then we'll approve them as amended that evening. But tonight we can just make a simple motion to approve, to approve. first reading. In that case. Mm -hmm. that yeah. would. All right. So I believe Mr. Castillo moved. Yes, Madam Chair, I move that we uh, approve first reading of bylaw 2.23 and policies uh, 8.27, 8.29, 8.74, 9.37, 9.38, and 9.63. All right. Second. Thank you, Mr. Sharp, for a second. Please say aye if you agree. Aye. 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 Are there any opposed? All right, very good. Good work, Mr. Horn. We appreciate that. Uh, the next item is the approval of the Falls Church Triennial Plan for 2015 to 2017 for the benefit of the community. This was part of our summer homework and summer school for the board was to take the triennial plan from last year review it, evaluate it, revise it, and update it for this year. Subsequent to that, we asked staff to put together a one-year work plan, which you see later in this agenda. Um, so there has been a good deal of discussion on the part of the board uh, about this. I'm going to ask if there's any further discussion, and if not, then we'll uh, make a motion to approve our new set of priorities. So any further questions or thoughts about this? Are we good to go? All right, seeing none, I'm going to ask for a motion, please. Madam Chair, I move that the school board approve the, the Falls Church City Public Schools Triennial Plan 2015 through 2017 as presented. Is there a second? Second. Thank you very much, Mr. Lawrence. All in favor, please say aye. 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 And any opposed? All right, very good. Um, Dr. Jones, if you and your team would make sure that that this document is readily available on our website, that it's pushed out through all of our communication channels so the community understands what our priorities are. I would also ask that uh, school board liaisons to various boards and commissions, if you would please at your next meeting uh, take copies of this or ask staff to bring copies of it and go through it with our boards and commissions so that they understand what our three year priorities are if you are an SAO liaison or um, a PTA liaison. I just want to make sure everybody in the community has a chance to have this presented to them by a school board member to ask questions and understand exactly, you know, what it is that, that we are doing in terms of our three year uh, priorities. And if you can think of other places to push it out, let's do that too, because we want everybody to understand what it is. Yes. We'll take that up in a minute. Thank you. All right. Very good. Um, Mr. Lawrence believes you would like to make a comment about concussions. Is that true? You're going to have to, like, wave at me. <laughs> we had this with Maeve, too. She was very quiet to start. I was actually start. going to ask what, like, if the specification needs to be made about student athletes in the last red part, but we discussed that in length. We took care of it? Yeah. So thank All right. You. Very good. Very good. Thank you, Mr. Lawrence. All right, so we now have a uh, triennial plan. And uh, the next thing on our agenda is approval of a draft Mount Daniel Comprehensive Agreement. And Dr. Jones, I will turn that over to you. Um, for the draft Comprehensive Agreement, I sent this out, oh, I think about two weeks ago, just for you to have plenty of time to look at because there's a lot in it. Um, but Bob uh, Jones with Arcadis works uh, very closely on this. And what we're looking for tonight are just questions or comments um, that you have after having time to review it. And then he will go back and do the work to actually start plugging in the name um, with the firm that we've chosen after the referendum that we would actually do business with. And we would bring this back to you again in October, kind of ready to go after hearing some of your comments. There is on the third attachment in the Mount Daniel cost items. And just for clarification, these are things that um, are not actually in uh, the PPEA as far as what Grunley has presented. And so 
It's just making sure that you know those are cost additions. And one of these actually came up last night um, at City Council Liaison Meeting, which was the lead um, silver. And there is a price cost on here, so it gives you an idea if you wanted to add something like that, what it would be. I just remind the school board that we, the 15 million includes everything that was in our RFP, but there's not one penny more to really add these things. So we do have to plan for them in the budget if we're going to add them, which is you know not unusual. We can, Hunter and I have to work on that when we go through the budgeting process. And I'll give you an example, the carpet, for instance. Um, the second one, we know that we want to add the carpet because when they did their proposal uh, for a K-1-2 building, they put all tile. And in an elementary classroom, we definitely want partial carpet. So we know that that's one that will be added. Bob, do you wanna <laughs> add anything to what I just said? <laughs> no, I think, um Basically, the comprehensive agreement is the same standard contract that we use for TJ, and it'll just be customized for this particular project. Um, what it does is it locks them into a construction cost limit of 15 million, so that basically it says they have to do the project for 15. Once we get to 65% design, they'll submit their guaranteed maximum price, and we'll also have a chance to negotiate that with them. And if the construction comes in less than the guaranteed maximum price, then we'll have shared savings again, where it's 75% schools, 25% uh, contractor. Okay. And some of these, um, these cost items um, are just add alternates that they proposed if, you know, for us to select. I think the, the lead silvers, the, uh, they're required in the contract to the actual building construction will be to lead silver standards. And then this is the additional cost to actually get the building certified. Right. Is there uh, any questions? Um, I would just sh want to, I guess by way of history, say that we've had questions before about lead certification of school facilities. And I believe the position of the board has been that we will build to certain standards of certification, in this case, silver, mm -hmm. but that we wouldn't trade off classroom space or, or um, amenities or students' needs simply to get an official certification. Um, we'd be happy if the city council would want to increase our budget for us to be able to do that if city council thinks it's a priority. But our position has always been that we're going to build the best building for sustainability for our kids to existing policy which doesn't include schools. So I think that's a conversation we need to be sure to have with city council. We're happy to do it, but not if it costs us carpet or tile or, you know, smart boards or things that, this, particularly since the building has been built to that standard, right? So right. just right. wanted to kind of. And if the board feels differently about that now, we can certainly have a discussion before this is all over about that. Mr. Lawrence, did you have something to say? Not on that specifically, something different. I know, but did you have something, a question to ask? Yeah, I, I just, and I, because of work, I haven't had a chance to go through these as, as detailed as I, I normally, so you're in luck tonight. <laughs> um, but I did have one question in, should there be something about working with the community in here? We had that in the RFP about how important it was and that they had to have, you know, they had to show that they had worked with communities before because we've been working with the neighbors so much. Is there something in here about you've got a responsibility to continue to work with the community or should that be somewhere else? We had it in the RFP saying that yeah, you, you the, had um, to meet those standards, so we've got to have it somewhere going forward. Yeah, I can... Uh, I can add language in it that specifically talks about the uh, ASAC committee and committee meetings and well, in neighborhood in associations neighborhood. and things like that because, well, y y you know enough about what went on before with the neighborhood and we've been talking to them a lot and um, I just want to make sure that, you know, assuming this does go forward that they know that, you know, we're going to keep talking with them on a, on a regular basis and, you know, the company that's doing it is also legally required to because I think that would just be a sign of very good faith and something we would do anyway but because of that I think having it in writing was even better 
Okay. If you can draft some language, but be careful with the breadth and depth of it. I, I want to be sure that what we're asking is reasonable and that we don't have a contractor who's legally obligated to do essentially whatever anybody thinks they should be obligated to do. Yeah, they're... So we can be a little... If we can hit the right mm -hmm. note. Right. And they're also... They have to go through the Fairfax 2232 process, which is... Uh, there's a lot of community uh, interaction with that, that whole process to get the site development plan approved. Right, but that's... I, I'm talking also during construction. I mean, the 2232 is really before you get the approval. Right. I'm talking about after you get the approval, going forward, going through, you know, Tony's checklist, which will, you know, go on for another year after the school is opened. Um, but, but yes, we need to make it so that it's broad enough so that it's engagement, it's continuous engagement with the community, but it's not, you have to meet with them, you know, for at least an hour every two weeks or, you know, else. Yeah, and I think a lot of the community will be part of my role also because mm -hmm. they'll generally oh, have yeah. you know my phone number and email if there's any problems right but but for instance That's when we were doing stuff. northgate um when i was on the planning commission the city made sure that there was somebody specific on the site every day who could be a point of contact so if you know construction traffic was going up the wrong road if they were parking in the wrong place the neighbors felt that they had somebody they could call to to get it remedied and there weren't that many calls, but the fact that they had somebody they could call really made a difference for a, a very small <laughs> row. Yeah, you might yeah. have heard something about that. I think we have someone yeah. to do that. Yeah. I think that's part of Bob's job. Yeah, Bob's job. Yeah, Bob's no, if, 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 that's, that. if that's him and we make that clear to the community, that's great. I'm just saying having somebody and not making it clear doesn't get us anywhere. So, Bob, if you'll just, if you'll draft something, having listened to all this, that you think, well, help the community feel comfortable but will not unduly legally obligate us to situations we may find troublesome okay that would be great all right anything else yes mr nkuma let's look at the man daniel cost item i, I want to understand options one and two are these additional over and above the cost column okay so the cost column is a given and if we go with option one, we have those additional three items, and if we go with option two, there are those additional five items. Right, on, on option one and two, um, when you look at option one, we, you know, we would say that sprinkler and ceiling tile, that's the existing classrooms that are not going away on when you walk in the building on that left-hand side. There are a few classrooms there. Um, being that we're going to put sprinklers in all of the building, that's a highly likely something that I would think the school board is going to want as a cost option, because um, you wouldn't want to just leave, you know, I think it's eight classrooms without a sprinkler system in there. Okay. Um, on the second one, that is flooring and paint for those same rooms. So that's really more of a cosmetic, not something we would have to do. But again, it's hard to have, um, you know, 65,000 square feet with brand new carpet and tile and then have 20,000 without. Um, so making even the hallway blend will, will be important. So that's where option one, you could not do that because it's cosmetic. But option two is probably where mm -hmm. we would recommend. But Okay. All right. Great. Any other questions? Mr. Castillo? Uh, just one, well, two questions, actually. On the... Uh, On 7.4 of the comprehensive agreement, it talks about a CAD system as part of the ad build, as built. Is that the BIM or BIM-like product? That specifically is not BIM, but uh, Grunley and Samaha, who are actually going to do the design, actually use BIM, so that they will be using that on this project. Okay, so so it's. Coke and Pepsi, pretty much, or or well, or it'll it, be it'll be Coke. CAD, I think um, CAD is more of your just your to be uh, simple about it, it's just more like a your drafting software. But but as part of the it talks about what everybody seems to say is BIM's the greatest thing since sliced bread, and you got to have it because BIM um, actually models the building and all the different pieces of the building so that. You know, it's not just drawing a line on the page. It's this piece making sure actually this has doesn't to match up with that piece. 
And since we have the old and the new, that seems like a good idea. So, yes. so, so will we get the, the BIM resources when they're done as part of the as-builts? We will probably get the, uh, the files, the drawing files, but uh, I believe that's separate software, and I don't think they'll be supplying us the software with it. But we can, we can read whatever they give us in the end. So we can see that the, the it, it's, I, I, just, I just know enough to be dangerously <laughs> ignorant. Obviously. Um, <laughs> um, I would everybody to, says, you, yeah, I would have to find out what type of readable file that produces. So okay. I'm not exactly sure. Can you help that. him understand what your what your concern is? Well, the, 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 that we that we it, I mean, there's a, there are, there are references to CAD as built. Um, there is the value of the BIM product. I just want to make sure that one of the things we're asking for is the BIM information in something we can read. Um, okay. Thanks. Or maybe I'm just asking for the as built in a different way, in which case I will move on to my other question. <laughs> so, um, the, the, on the um, alternate cost, there's 2,000 square feet coming off. And yes, since um, the um, think, um, Grunley um, went a little above and beyond the program and some of the spaces that they felt would be better if they made them a little larger. And they've added about 2,000 square feet to their design above and beyond what the program called for. So they, they added the line item. If they wanted us to pull back to just the program square footages, then that, that savings would be realized. And are we thinking about doing that? I mean, you can never be too rich, too thin, or have enough school space, right? So right, and that's and that's what I've said to Bob. I I mean, we would be very hesitant to cut back square footage. Um, you know, if you save 275, you could, and I think that's why it's on there. You could apply it to pay for the sprinkler and pay for the carpet. Um, but because we have plenty of time to plan over the next two years, I think we'll be able to carpet on our own with good planning and work, and with a great finance person over there to help. Um, so that, that would just be, I think, if we wanted to have a trade-off and apply it in a different way. But I wouldn't recommend that we cut square footage. Okay. Madam Thanks. Chairman. And yes. I'm, I'm sorry. Oh, go ahead. Sorry. And there, between now and the um, GMP, there's, there's plenty of time. I mean, that whole time we'll be looking for places we can save and, you know, add and trade things on and off. So we've got basically till we lock in a GMP to make final decision. Thank you. Mr. Sharp, you had something? Yeah, I think my question uh, refers to that time period. In the comprehensive agreement that we have uh, available to us tonight, it has a list of potential exhibits, but the exhibits aren't, aren't described for us right, in any detail. That's they will be as part of the, the, GM, the GMP negotiation process, right? All those attachments will be there when the, I guess, October, when we look at it again. And but those will show the number of rooms, exactly where things are placed. Correct. And it, things it'll, of it'll that have character. It'll proposal. We still get to um, make design decisions at each step, you know, at 10%, 35, 65. We'll be able to um, make adjustments. It's just... Basically, the footprint of the building and the main rooms are, are pretty well locked in. I, I would just ask that we receive information that tells us trade-offs in regard to environmental and sustainability concerns in addition to square footage mm -hmm. uh, so that uh, you know, we have a, a, a full scope of the trade-offs that are being uh, talk uh, that, that are that are potentially available to us. There, there are two specific things that I'm concerned about that have uh, environmental concerns. One is uh, the play area, uh, and currently, or at least in in the past, the play area uh, on that side of the building has continued to include hardscape play area. I think that may be unnecessary in the plan that we finally go forward with here. We will still have hardscape play area on the other side of the building. I think we should ask ourselves whether 
the trade-off for that hardscape uh, is, is appropriate uh, if we can indeed obtain a, a green space there, including potentially a small soccer field. The second thing is that we will have temporary relocatable buildings during construction, and I'd like us to have a very, <laughs> a very strong uh, exchange of views over whether those remain after the building is built. <laughs> uh, I, th I think the idea right now is for those to be temporary and for them to be removed. But right. at the point, but <laughs> uh, many uh, of our projects in the past, uh, at the point where we look around and say, do we want to give up any square footage? We've looked at the trailers and said, no, we won't give up the square footage. And I think there again, I would like to receive information about the trade-offs that we're really talking about in terms of environmental concern, uh, the, uh, the sustainability, and that includes things like, I hope we learned some lessons from the, the sustainability of the trailers at TJ, that they don't last as long as the permanent building. They have other problems that may be connected with them uh, that the, the, main, the main building, uh, if, if, we, if we were able to build permanent building space, that wouldn't, uh, you know, those problems wouldn't arise. So I, I want us to, to, to make, make a, a specific decision and not just go by inertia <laughs> uh, into keeping the trailers that, that are gonna be there. Yeah, I think the, uh, the trailers that Grunley will be providing will probably be just rentals, and they won't be put in, you know, they'll, they'll be put in as temporary trailers. I, I don't think they would even be suitable for thinking them as being permanent. All right, any other questions? Is somebody wanting to make a motion on this? Madam Chair, uh, I move <laughs> that I get to the right box. I move the school board approve. Uh, excuse me. Um, I approve, the, I move that the school board approve the draft Mount Daniel Comprehensive Agreement as presented by Arcadis. Thank you. Second. Thank you very much. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? All right. Thank you very much, Thank Bob. You. Good job. All right. Moving right along uh, to the approval of the renewal master agreement with Arcadis, Dr. Jones. And this is just so that we can keep working with Arcadis, which would be really great. Um, this is just a renewal of the contract that we have um, had with Arcadis, and we do um, renew it. The one thing that is different is we are writing a contract with Manassas. Um, previously, it was a contract that they, Arcadis, had with Alexandria, so that is different. Um, doesn't change anything, but this is simply so we can continue to work with um, Arcadis to renew the contract. Thanks very much. Any, uh, any questions on... This in? Right here? No. All right. Is there a motion, please, to approve this? Move. move that the school board approve a renewal of the master agreement with Arcadis from August 2014. All right. Second. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? All right. Very good. Uh, next is um, Approval of the updated 2015-17 FCCPS work plan. This is the document I mentioned earlier that complements our three-year priorities. And you can think of it as the one-year detailed operating plan for our staff to be able to make progress on the priorities that the community and the school board have set. So, Dr. Jones. Uh, once again, we have a very robust plan. What we have done is we've gone through and taken out um, anything that was accomplished, um, unless it had a three-year plan where there's still more to do on it, and then added those things like the STEAM committee, uh, STEAM advisory that we're adding. So it's just an update of the plan and the work that we had last year to match what your priorities are for us. And we will get it up on the wall and start going to work. <laughs> All right, does anybody have questions about the work plan for Dr. Jones? We've had a, a lot of discussion about this in the summer. All right, is there, oh, that's Just Mr. Lawrence, one, yes. one, not so much a question, but 
are we, you, you took off things that have been done. Mm -hmm. Are we making sure to keep that as a list so that when we get to maybe budget times, we can go back and actually point to a long list of things that we said we were going to do and we did and we checked off and we moved on so that for anybody who might have forgotten that we were doing things, not just asking for new things, we would have something to point to? We are. We, I mean, I, I keep it all up on my wall, literally, and, mark, and highlight it all and mark it off as it's completed and keep that. I'm really trying to figure out, going into this is the second year, what's the best way to keep the, the accumulation uh, over the years so that I can see it. I haven't quite figured that out yet. Um, so I'll get the new one up, keep the old one, and then um, I'll be updating the school board as well. Great. Anything else? All right. Can I call for a motion? Madam Chair, I move that the school board approve the updated 2015 through 2017 work plan. Thank you very much. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Are there any opposed? All right. Very good. So we're ready to go for the year. I just want to make a quick comment, which is to say how much I like this new planning process, mm -hmm. how much people in the community have told me they appreciate having on one piece of paper what the priorities are. It makes it really easy for them to understand what we're about. And, uh, and for the superintendent and her team to include a, a really detailed operational plan, including metrics and measurements and performance, so that people really understand what we're about. So I just, just want to say I'm, I'm really pleased with uh, how we've evolved our planning process over the years. Um, next is uh, Dr. Jones going to give us a construction update. Um, first of all, I'll just uh, speak quickly to Mount Daniel. Um, and I'm glad you approved our CADIS contract because it makes a difference for the work that Bob can do tomorrow and he's ready to go. Um, we, John and I were both uh, over at the PTA meeting at the elementary tonight where the PTA was taking a vote on being able to support the referendum as the elementary PTA and they were unanimous in a very loud um, room. We were in the gym at, starting the ice cream social so it was, it was an interesting event but we did have a, a, they did have a vote so there was that support. Along with Matt Daniel, the other thing and I, I did update you on my Friday note last week. We're still working on traffic issues there. Um, on our first kindergarten, on our Meet the Teacher Day, it was fantastic. We closed the street. When I reached out to the community, they didn't even know we'd had an event. First day of school, we tried to close certain areas, closed off part of the street uh, on parking, trying to help with that. It still was not enough, and so we know going forward, on, even on the first day of school, we will have to shut Oak Street so that we can really mitigate the traffic. And we, we got an email uh, pretty quick that morning to say, someone who took a picture, um, it's very difficult to get the bus up Oak Street because of the parking issues if cars are on both sides. And it does mean that one bus has to kind of just stop down at the bottom of the hill until the other bus gets down. But we're continuing to work with the community and I think they appreciate that they're seeing a difference. So um, on pre-K, just to update you there, just um, moving right along as far as the inside of the building. Um, if you go by there, you can see the roof is on. It's kind of a light green color. They're gonna get the um, outside on the building, which is the yellow. Uh, portion and the hardy board will start going on. Lots of work on the inside. Their drywall is all done. They're starting to prime. And then in another, I think it'll probably be another two weeks before we probably want to go in. It's more fun when it looks like an actual school inside. So I'm setting up a visit for that. The biggest challenge um, with our pre-K will be the parking lot. As you know, that's a city project for the stormwater. And I'm hoping they can aggressively get that done. I will say I had a little bit of a scare yesterday when they said it's supposed to snow in a huge way at the end of September. I hope not. Um, John Brett and I saw the weather report for this winter, and we were like, oh, please, no. But, um, so I'm really hoping. That's, that's always when you get into September, October, November, and you're working with parking lots, um, it'll be watching the weather closely. But they're doing everything they can to go aggressively on that. And we're communicating well with the community that live around there as well. Everything from changing bus stops, letting them know when we're doing noisy things or we're going to block the street uh, for any reason, even for short term. And then the last thing, I have two more. The last one would be the trailers. We did get our trailers in. You know, in time to get kiddos in there over at TJ. Um, I know Kieran had a wonderful view on this Saturday and probably thought there is no way we're going to have anybody in this place. Um, just trying to get everything moved in. It looked like a mud pile and still trying to get the ramps in. But um, lots of people pulled all stops as well as city. We had a lot of help from city staff and the inspector literally came every single day um, so that we could get everything cleared. And last but not least on here, we do have um, a document for TJ, task two. And this is just showing you the shared savings. Um, and this 
this is why it has taken a, a while. As you know, Bob is very diligent for us, goes through every single um, item and makes sure that it's accounted for in the cost accounting. And so when he was working with, and some things are negotiated uh, with Hess on that, there was a total shared savings, uh, just under 60000 which means that in the CIP, there's $44,756 that is, does not get accessed. So we actually had savings on task two, so we were pleased to see that. And that's it. Thank you very much. I'm, I'm pleased to see that the savings on task two are just about the same amount as it's going to take to put that little green roof on Mount Daniel. <laughs> Madam, Chair, can, Madam Chair, can I have a question? Um, so, yes, any questions about that? Mr. Nkuma. I was just wondering, is Thackeray on schedule? The building, the Thackeray for when the building is supposed to be complete is absolutely on schedule. And they'll have it ready, without a doubt, okay. the building. Okay. And but it will be the parking lot which ah. is the stormwater project and that goes right, you have to have a parking lot to get kiddos in the building. So that's expected to be completed, the building by? Uh, I think we told you the move-in date is, I wanna say is it, it's that long weekend is that we planned it. It's actually October is the, when you could move in, but we have planned it for the long weekend, which is like the third, I believe, and fourth. Okay. Of November. Yeah, of November, so okay. we have four days. Madam Chairman. Yes, Mr. Yeah, Mr. Sack, Mr. Uh, Sack. No. Yeah. Uh, a couple of comments, if I may. Please. Uh, one is that we have on the uh, Arcadis record here, and, and I'm also glad that we approved the contract for going forward with them. Uh, but we have we have sixty thousand dollars of savings uh, from from a project that we weren't sure we'd, we'd get all that we were supposed to. To get in the first place, and instead we got a lot more than we than we really uh, initially thought we would. More rooms, more renovations to the um, old side of the building, and uh, Arcadis, I think, is is a big reason why that happened. Uh, and it it is again a, a repeat for them of of kind of what happened at Mary Ellen Henderson, where on a on a bigger scale, a bigger project, we had half a million dollars of savings. Here we have 60,000 on a, on a project that's about one third the cost that Mary Ellen Henderson was. Uh, the, the other uh, point I'd like to make is that T Tony is exactly right. When I was there on that Saturday, uh, things, I'll describe them as they look, it was a mess. <laughs> <laughs> it, was, it was a real mess. Um, and there were, uh, you know, several trucks that came up to the curb and they were loaded to the gills with furniture and, and other equipment. And uh, I walked inside the, uh, you know, the, the trailer buildings, nothing was, nothing was there. The, the, uh, uh, the fan in the, in the men's room was, was like an aircraft carrier was, you know, the, like, like something was landing on an aircraft carrier. Um, and, and there, there was uh, landscaping that was, that was uh, torn up around the, uh, the trailers, but also in front, of the, uh, in front of the main entrance. And all of that was taken care of prior to the time that, uh, that staff and students began to occupy those areas. And uh, Tony, I don't know how you did it, frankly, um, <clears throat> but she was there cracking <laughs> you know, whatever she was cracking, uh, that's right. And she was making it happen. It was, it was, it was really marvelous to see. Now I think there, you know, there are still some, some uh, details uh, that I think are, are going to need to get tied up. Just as what, what we were seeing tonight about uh, task two. This is, the, you know, t task two was supposed to kind of wrap up uh, last November, but we still had punch list things and things to go through that carried us all the way through to, to today. Uh, but at, at the end of the day, uh, Tony got us the ability to uh, move in last year on time at Mount Daniel. Uh, obviously, we stayed within, uh, pardon me, at TJ. Obviously, we stayed in you know, within budget. And again, uh, this year, having to replace the trailers on an emergency basis, bringing in new, new trailers and swapping them out after uh, there was some opportunity for, for use of them as a last ditch thing during the summer. Period. Um, just, just again, a remarkable um, turn of events, 
and, uh, and Tony was there night and day making sure that things happened. So thank you for getting that done. Uh, and I know you had lots of help from, from other members of the staff, but uh, uh, we, we, uh, we, we, we cracked the whip on you. Well, this, this is a pat on the back. It's not, it's not a crack on the, it's not a crack of the whip. Thank you again very much. Thank you, Mr. Sharp. Mr. Lawrence, did you have something? Yeah, just uh, Tony and I had a, a talk earlier. I just want her to explain to all of us how these savings aren't actually ours and they don't belong to us. I mean, it looks like we should have money left over for us, but is that the case? We really, we do and we don't. It's because we share an account with the city, it's sitting in the CIP. So I think if we make a request for that and we have a, something specific that uh, the green roof or something of that nature, then it, but right now it just sits there because it's, it's in there together. And so it's where Richard may take it and do a pay go. Um, mm -hmm. yeah. Okay, good. Thank you. Anything else? Um, Dr. Jones, I'm gonna ask you at this point if you could prepare a very simple one page summary of that project that would um, outline uh, what we spent, what we saved, what we originally were planning to get and what we got. And I'd like to share that with our uh, colleagues in the Planning Commission and our colleagues on the city staff and the city council so that they can see the good work that you and your team did to spend the money wisely and to get far more than we originally anticipated and make sure that gets posted in, uh, on our website and made available to the community as well because uh, I think it's just a great, great job and, you know, great, great job. All right, Miller House update, 7.07. Um, as you know, this was on our school board agenda, I think the last time we met officially in here. Mm -hmm. um, but with Miller House, we did get an update from Nancy Vincent, and this kind of just provides you the overview, and they have been discussing it. She would love to have support from the school board. She, you know, has did not necessarily requested that. She just let us know that if we wanted to send something tomorrow so that she could actually um, take that forward as they're looking and, and talking about supporting the project. From her perspective, she actually talks about um, that we do have special needs, you know, children in the school division who will grow up and live here, and that this is is a group home for four to six persons uh, with disabilities and that um, you know it, it would the first choice goes to a resident of Falls Church so it in fact could help um, some of our children that you know live here now that want to live on their own as they get older and this is a facility shared with Arlington County I am not I, my understanding is that it's Falls Church residents have priority so I did not understand that it's shared from what from what Nancy has said well but it must be because we would have priority over who. So it must be like Aurora House is an Arlington and F Falls Church joint project. It must be Arlington County. I yeah, I can double check on that for you. That I, I'm not sure about. All right, so yes, she, would, uh, she would find it helpful for us to be supportive of this. Right. All right, um, Mr. Sharp. Uh, I'd, I'd like to understand a little more about the, the program and who's doing it. Uh, the brief statement we have here at least I don't, I don't see what nonprofit is is being engaged or has has agreed to take over the property and and uh, whether that um, agency is is actually planning to do a a, a group home for um, like people who are aging out of the school system and into adulthood um, is 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 that is that what's actually happening um, and. If, if, we ha if we had more detail, I'd, uh, I'd, I'd certainly uh, give, give very strong consideration to, uh, to supporting it. But uh, at least, uh, is, 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 is it here and I'm not seeing it? <laughs> no, it's, no. no, I don't see it. Because I, I think well, the last time we saw it, it was that, that the, the city would be offering this um, and, and that some um, nonprofit could, could bid on buying the property and then basically tearing down the house, putting up a new house and developing a program to be done in the house. Yeah. And all of that is, is sort of not, not here. <laughs> uh, if, if, if we had, if we had a, a stronger description, I think we could, we could say, boy, that, that looks great. Let's, let's support it. Great, thank you. Any other questions? Yes. Yes, Mr. Nkuma. On, on this one, uh, to Kieran's point, I, I guess what I'm trying to understand is, are we being notified 
or are we as a school board do we have an obligation to this um I think just out of courtesy, okay. <clears throat> they wanted us to know <coughs> that the project was was being presented to council, and they were just looking for support um, from different organizations around the city uh, that would be supportive of the project. And so we got notification, and they asked that we, you know, would you consider this on your school board agenda? So we, because we do have a close relationship with them, obviously we brought it to you. But oh. I can ask Nancy uh, Vincent for more information. Okay, so we don't have to do anything about this. No, we don't have any sort of approval. It really was just the school board, you know, think this is a, a great project, you know, in our community, and they're just looking for community support and want, thought the school board would be a great community body to support it. Oh, okay, thank you. All right. Anything else? Yeah, so just if she, if she has a, something more she could send us, that would be really helpful. I know it doesn't help her by her September 10th deadline, but. All right. I think uh, done with that. Um, so uh, next is uh, future agenda topics. Um, Zach, just so you'll know, this is the place in our agenda, each meeting where anyone on the board or yourself can suggest topics that they'd like to have taken up by the board in the future. What we then do is a quick round the table. If you know four or five or more are interested in that, then we ask uh, the superintendent and the chair to figure out when and where and how we might take that topic up. But it's a, a, a chance for everybody to kind of speak up on, see if there are things that they might like to put on the agenda. So I'm kind of looking at Ms. Ward and Mr. Ankuma. And Mr. Anybody have a topic for future agenda? Yes, Mr. Castillo. Uh, I, I would propose, I would mentioned this earlier, if we could maybe do a, a little bit of a sampler of high C courses, maybe the finance, uh, AP Gov, and maybe the health, um, just so we kind of get a flavor of what's out there and what's it like. We do have that scheduled. Okay. Uh, we just needed, we wanted to get the doors open for you first, and then Mr. Hills, who oversees that program, our assistant principal, it will be here in front of you. Um, and I can't remember what date we put on there, actually. We were working on that today. Yeah, we've got him scheduled. Great. Thank you. Very well. good. Anybody else have something they want to take up? All right, very good. Oh, yes, Mr. Sharp. Um, I wonder if Mr. Horn has developed a kind of priority list of policies that we may need to update as part of the General Assembly's uh, activity in the last uh, last year. Um, I have, and, and what we have scheduled is in every other month alternating first read, second read, mm -hmm. and we will do that through the course of the year. Um, the ones you saw tonight are the only General Assembly mandates that, that our policies were out of compliance with. As we go through the rest, there were several options, um, optional changes, and there were several legislative changes that did not require policy changes. They may require change in practice, but not policy. Um, so we'll be doing a first reading one month, second reading another month, and we will develop the schedule for you. In October, you'll see November's proposed first readings. And in December, you'll see January's proposed first reading. So you'll be ahead of the game in terms of what we are reviewing and what the schedule is. Um, and if you'd like, we can create, we've talked about this, a web presence for future policy revisions. Um, we could even accept comment on them well in advance of first readings if you wanted to go that route. Great. Does that help? Yeah, that, that's, that answers the general question. Uh, a more specific one is uh, my understanding was that the General Assembly dealt with some ethics questions um, and that those have some impact on public officials, uh, gift uh, ceilings uh, for uh, public officials. Uh, I, if, if they only apply at the state, you know, state official level, that's, that's fine. Uh, but I guess I'd like to, to know <laughs> if that's the case. Uh, and uh, just a... <laughs> A quick, quick question about the, uh, uh, the, the uh, recent uh, court activity that we've seen in, involving the former governor. Uh, my understanding is that that was a federal uh, uh, criminal indictment and not a state, so it wasn't state law that was being violated there, it was uh, federal law. Um, but uh, at some point, uh, uh, it doesn't have to be fast, but at some point, I guess I'd like to see a kind of quick uh, summary of 
you know, are there are there some federal ethics restrictions that uh, that we as public officials should be aware of? I, I know in the past we've always received the uh, the conflict of interest and the freedom of information uh, as as revised as of you know July one, and uh, anticipate we'll see those again, but. They, they may not cover all that we need to, uh, to be Yeah, aware I of. think um, if it's appropriate and you'd like, we can include it with the second reading, which probably would be short of policies next in October, um, give a brief impact statement um, and an update on the federal guidelines for you guys, if they apply. We can do that in October if it's appropriate. Great. Anything else, Mr. Sharp? Thank you. <laughs> Yes, Mr. Webb. Just real quick to what Mr. Sharp's question about the uh, rules with uh, gifts. Uh, they did pass something, but it was vetoed by the governor because he felt it was not strong enough. So at this point, there has been no change in, in the policy and uh, leadership in the state, Senate and the House of Delegates both have now said as of today that they do plan to address that again this General Assembly session. Thank you. That update. Madam All Chair. right. Yes, Mr. Um, uh, Kieran, uh, you may want to start by handing back that gift basket. Um, <laughs> anyway, my, to my to my my question is as a and I'll keep calling myself a rookie till the end of the year. So, but as we go into this uh, VSBA, oh, I think it's the nineteenth of November, right? Um, it, it, would it be too late after that if we gather some ideas from that conference to come up with future agenda items or it's always? We, we have this item on the agenda every month. Time. Okay. So That's, there's no, there's no time, time that it's time too limit. late. Okay. Any time. And in fact, you don't need to wait for this at all. If you have things that you think that the board should take up any time, if you would send Dr. Jones and myself a note, then we'll uh, route it out to the board or we'll put it on the next agenda or whatever. So don't feel like you have to wait for that. We just, it's just a convenient way to make sure that everybody in the board understands that they have a chance to bring things to the group that they think are important. All right, so next would be the superintendent's report. Yes. I'm not sure if this is appropriate for um, the agenda items or student leaders and comments and I guess I'll just combine them. But, um, as we're approaching the new year and we're seeing teachers change classrooms and uh, uh, deal with new devices, I'm having some students talk to me about uh, how teachers may or may not be using, they have these incredible devices, but um, maybe our, we're, we're all struggling teachers and students with uh, how to use them. And so I'm wondering if possible, while we're approaching new, new schools and um, buying these new technologies, if it's possible to also, if, I'm not sure if this is included, but to include classes and to include a lot more educational software and, um, educational opportunities for both teachers and students relating to the, like we're just getting these incredible uh, uh, tools and I'm not sure that people know how to use them. And so okay. I just think maybe we should take that into account. And then on a separate note, um, I, this is kind of a idealistic uh, item, but um, I know that we, George Mason especially, used to host a wide variety of language opportunities. And I know that at this point, we may not have the capabilities to support them in a standard classroom setting. But as we continue to push uh, high C opportunities and online opportunities, I would wonder if the board would consider uh, taking into account possible online high C or even like Skype kind of, not, not Skype, but like some kind of online mm -hmm. classes for languages as well. I, I myself take one uh, outside of school and it, I find it uh, very effective, especially since speaking with someone, I speak, with, I take a Chinese class online. It, it's much cheaper than you would imagine. And, I'm not sure if it's something that the board would consider, but I just think it's an interesting opportunity as we continue to uh, promote technology in the, those kinds of online classes. Great, thank you. I'm gonna ask uh, Dr. Jones and Ms. High to huddle on that a little bit and I come back to us. That. Oh, yeah, okay. I can answer that. Um, actually on, and that was actually the first thing on my superintendent's report. That's where we are right now. We are okay. at the superintendent's report. Okay, um, is just saying that we did, you know, have 30, I think it was 33 sessions on personalized learning, just incredible um, time spent to make sure parents understood what personalized learning meant. And it really, I think, you know, what Zach is saying, it hits the nail on the head in that it's really about transforming 
what's happening in the classroom. It's not really about the device. We have teachers at many, many different levels. Some of them are at that master level and they're really helping their colleagues. We have some who technology is harder. Um, we have a lot of professional development going on right now, and I don't know if you've seen Mr. Lingle, who's at the high school this week, is there all week. Um, he has helped us all summer long, and he is an expert and a technology consultant in making sure we're bringing in the best. Um, he's done this all around the world and all around the country, and I know that he's working with each department this week, and they're, they're actually having what they call a spa day, and um, <laughs> that's where you go in, you look at your curriculum, and you say, how can I make it over to look at what's already there, but not just to put a document on a Word document, but how do you really transform the learning activity so that the devices are doing exactly what I think our students know they can do. But our growth is probably going to be depending on who the teacher is. Some it will be slower and some it will be faster. But we're working on that. And if you have educational software that your teachers are saying you guys need, you know, we've made a commitment to make sure we push it out. And it's uh, literally the texts have it in one spot. They push it out to the self-serve and then kids can download it. It's just making sure it comes to your teachers and your principals. So be sure you communicate that as a student body if there's something you guys are needing uh, to Mr. Bird or to your teacher. Um, the high C issue, we absolutely, that's where we're headed. Um, you know, we're full aware that our George Mason students having 260 kids hooked up in high C this summer was tremendous and uh, in many different ways. And we're doing a lot of course development to enhance to have it more interactive. And we've had the discussion about foreign language and we're looking at several different options. Um, there are certain courses, I don't think Spanish is one of them, French and I think maybe Chinese, but uh, if they're an IB course, you have to take it through the IB organization and we're moving in that direction. We've made the commitment this spring actually we'll be able to offer some things. We're also pairing very closely with NOVA right now, who for a lot of our students that want more advanced, they offer a lot online and really expanding high C um, as far as what kids can take and what's available. So we're working on all of that for you, and hopefully by, you'll see some of it in January. You're welcome. And now I, I just had a couple more things. Of course, we got school started, which is just a little video thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> great first week of school, though. Um, we just It's really fun to be out and about and see everything that is happening. And personalized learning is something we've embraced from kindergarten all the way through. And, um, and it's really it's, ex it's exciting to see what's happening in the classrooms. We also have a new Husky Trail. And not that you would necessarily notice unless you're a walker. Have you noticed? The oh, awesome. Um, <laughs> there are signs that go across the GM campus. And this goes back to, I wish Peter was here, because civic education is important to us. And it's huge in our middle school. And we do carry it forward into high school. And the kids all present projects every year. And as you know, people from all in the community come in and look at what is a real project that we need. And this was a student project where the kids said, you know, it's great that we're encouraging kids to walk. But we get on that big old campus, and the kids have no idea really which, where is the path to get across Mason to the middle school. So that was a student project that is new this year and, and was put out. So excited to see that. All of our fall sports have, have started. So, you know, feel free to come on out and have some fun there. Um, we've also had great feedback. And I put this in my Friday note last week about the start time at middle school. Um, just not having to get up at 745. And Mary Beth Conley was really celebrating that. She said for many years it's been uh, tough in their household. Um, and just a special thank you to our BIE, all of our business partners, our uh, PTAs, our band boosters, everybody that supported convocation, uh, the t-shirts, Falls Church Education Foundation, those t-shirts you got tonight, and the staff love those. And the QR code on the back does work, which is really fun. Um, but just lots of support and welcoming our new staff as well. And last but not least, Run for the Schools is Sunday. So if you can get out, come and join us. It's a great event. If you don't want to run, you can just take pictures at the finish line and tweet them out. Okay. All right. Thank you very much. It's interesting. We've changed some of our start times this year. And reading the Washington Post, it looks as though um, Superintendent Garza and Fairfax County are starting to discuss exactly the same changes that we made a number of years ago that left us with early middle school start times that we're now changing this year to make our parents happy. So it would be interesting to see what they decided to do in Fairfax with their start times. All right. Thank you, Dr. Jones. It's now time for uh, board and student liaison comments. Zach, I'm going to call on you last to give you a chance to observe. And um, we'll start with, uh, with Margaret Ward. You know, this is the time of the night to sh share things that you think your colleagues need to know. Um, if you don't have anything to share, don't feel like you have to make it up. So, um, Ms. Ward. So, I really have nothing to share. I, the, um, the athletic boosters meeting was last night, and I started a 
my second to last grad class for my master's program, so I was unable to attend the meeting. I'm expecting some minutes, though, from them, and I can report that, if possible, at the next work session. Okay, thank you. Or you can just send out a summary by email if that's more convenient very to you, good. however very you like good. to do it. Thank you. Mr. Antonio, do you have anything to share this evening? Yes, uh, I was at the Chamber Board uh, meeting this morning. Um, obviously, it was more about the departure of the Assistant Director, but uh, what was also mentioned that had some implication for the schools was the uh, Legislative Committee's support of the Mason Road development. And uh, I was, my ears were peaked when I heard there'd be 67 condos and 200 plus apartments, not to mention all the other commercial activities, but I was f sort of focusing on, all right, what does that mean for enrollment and schools and as we go on in the future? So it was interesting to get an update on the fact that it wouldn't be just apartments, there'd be some permanence to it with uh, the 67 condos and the, the other stuff. Um, otherwise, uh, so that was on the chamber front this morning. I was sometime in the summer, I think it was a Friday, there was a, the election, at the, I went to the George Mason PTSA and there was the election of a new board, so we're working with Gabriela Santos, who's invited me. Well, I, I won't be there anyway, for, but tomorrow's a meeting, and I think, Tony, you're going to be there. So hopefully we can, uh, I don't know in what capacity we speak to them about the referendum, uh, maybe a citizens and not as board members, but we'll get to, we'll worry about that when we get there. So looking forward to that. Uh, but we met the board, uh, other members that I know have also been elected. So it's a good group that are coming in, looking forward to working with them. And then finally on the daycare advisory board, looks like things are chugging along. They seem to have a wait list, um, lots of, elementary school kids as, as usual, but uh, Kitty's sort of keeping things on, on track and we're getting a new board member. Marty, um, I guess we're, yeah, we will have a new board member that I've, I've spoken to and seems quite capable. She was on the Fairfax County's uh, is it SAC committee. Mm -hmm. uh, so, you know, she seems to know what, uh, what this would be about. So looking forward to working with her as well. Um, and I noticed that there's a trail, I, 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 did, I did a sort of drive around TJ the other day and there's a huge replacement trailer. Is that, that's not gonna be part of the, the, the kids or that they're still being housed in the, they're still being housed in the cafeteria and the, the gym, right? You're talking about the new trailer at TJ? Right. Those are classrooms. Those are classrooms, yeah. right, okay. All right, we used to have meetings in that so I was just sort of curious. But um, yeah, otherwise that's my report. Thank you very much. Mr. Castillo, you have things to share? Okay, this is going a bit into the Wayback Machine, but I, I did go to the, uh, the Google Education Summit back when it was <laughs> hot like and nobody ago. was in school. <laughs> and right. and you could wear ago. sandals and feel okay. Um, <laughs> and that was really interesting. There's, there's a lot of stuff out there. Um, you know, for example, uh, Google is really getting into more content-oriented things like virtual museums. Uh, uh, an eye opener. There was a teacher there who has gone Google Glass, mm. so she was there with her Google Glass on. So it was quite a, it was quite something. Um, there was somebody in my household who submitted uh, comments to the board regarding the start time at MEH. I have not heard a peep from her in complaint of that. <laughs> um, the convocation was. Uh, as always, uh, uh, very well done. We had the uh, debut of Gertie, um, as well as an interesting mashup of heads and bodies mix up pictures at the end. Um, I, I would uh, commend Vice Mayor Dave Snyder for some very supportive remarks. Um, and I think one of the things he touched on is the very idea of universal public education is itself a civic ideal. And everything that, that the public school system does I think is infused with that ethos. So I, I don't think it has to be bolted on. I think it's baked in. Obviously you can enhance that, but I think the vice mayor drove that point home. Uh, welcomed, I think 49 new teachers and 29, 25 staff. Um, learning a lot about volleyball and I have the, uh, from, the and from watching the volleyball uh, team play at JV and varsity, it's a lot of fun. Um, Went and attended as a parent the uh, personalized learning rollout. Um, also, uh, I think that's gone very well. Uh, 
the students I know are very enthusiastic. Um, and, and the last thing that I think is worth noting is on Saturday, my wife and I went to the initial visioning exercise for the parks in the city. And, and I think it, it drives home uh, a, a couple of things. I, I came across something that, that talked about cities. There are three kinds of cities. There are bellwether cities, bandwagon cities, and backwater cities. I think our, our school system is definitely a bellwether system, and I think this discussion at the parks meeting uh, had one data point, for example, Falls Church's population is supposed to increase by 30% by 2030. So think about that. <laughs> um, and meanwhile, they're not making any more land or any more parks. Um, but, but as we move forward, I think to make a bellwether city, this is worth weaving into the fabric of the schools in the city and our future. Um, you know, how we can make the schools part of a great public place and also to make Falls Church a great public place in the parks as well as everywhere else. And that's all I've got to say about that. All right, thank you. Um, Kieran? Thank you. Uh, over the summer, I've been uh, helping the Partnership for Youth to explore some opportunities for new direction. Uh, we had a kind of culmination meeting last night. There were five different options and they're, they're somewhat narrowed from other options. But anyway, uh, uh, there will be a meeting in early October to try to um, finalize what the, uh, what the direction will be. And I, I just will say that there are some things happening uh, with the partnership uh, that I think are, are, are very good things. I think the, uh, the partnership needed a, a new business model, uh, some new direction. The county itself has kind of taken over the earlier coordinating uh, activity of the partnership so that many of the networks of agencies will still be, still be uh, operating uh, and uh, that will be happening with, uh, with county staff doing much of that coordination. But there's still, uh, those, those folks have also asked for a, kind of a private sector coordinator to, to continue to operate. So um, but that may be one of the things that the partnership does. During September, the Partnership for Youth uh, uh, fundraiser is, uh, is with uh, Karen's Florist, if any of you are holding some events during uh, <laughs> during September that you'd like to have uh, a floral arrangement for, uh, please uh, contact Karen's and uh, ask them for the For Our Youth floral arrangement. It will support the Partnership for Youth. Uh, mentor training is still one of the things that the Partnership uh, for Youth is providing. And I know we have two mentoring programs here in Falls Church. Uh, those who would like to uh, become mentors receive the initial training. Uh, this, this can be helpful for you. That uh, this month's session is tomorrow night uh, at the Government Center in Fairfax in the Panino building uh, at 6.30. And uh, you can uh, find out more information about that on the partnership's website, which is fairfaxyouth.org. Tony mentioned the, uh, the run on Sunday, the Falls Church Education Association uh, is holding. Uh, it's the 10th annual. Registration for that continues online until Wednesday. Uh, and then after Wednesday, uh, people can still participate in the, in the run uh, by registering on Saturday. Uh, pardon me, Friday and Saturday, there will, there will be registration. On Friday, the registration will be at the Hilton Garden Inn in the afternoon. Uh, and you can take a tour of the new hotel as well as uh, sign up for the run at, at, at that uh, venue. On Saturday, of course, there's the Taste of Falls Church and the Fall Festival, and there'll be a booth uh, there uh, that the Falls Church Education will have. Uh, people can pick up their packets for the next day for the run. New registrations can also be taken at that time. New registrations can also be done on Sunday morning, right before the run but please uh, do so a half hour before the, the scheduled start of the run. I did circulate to the board uh, something that the Fairfax 
school board has been uh, developing over a number of months called the portrait of a graduate and it's uh, something that I hope will at least uh, take a, a, uh, a look at and uh, see if it has some value for us as a possible uh, uh, idea around which to, to think about this high school of the future idea that we've been, we've been uh, batting back and forth and how, how we might get to a process that, uh, uh, that helps us understand what that, what that should mean. Uh, Michael mentioned the, uh, the chamber, and uh, if you go on the chamber's website, you'll see lots of events for September, luncheons, uh, uh, a, a mini golf, right, Michael? Uh, and uh, uh, please uh, go and see uh, that there, there are several things that uh, the, the chamber uh, is doing, and they're very, very, uh, very much fun if, uh, for all different uh, kinds of, of audiences. The, the luncheons are great for business people, uh, but then the the, uh, the mini golf is a really f fun family event, uh, and I encourage uh, everyone to go look at, at the uh, fallschurchchamber.org website and, and see those events for September. Um, that's all I have for tonight. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Webb? Thank you. Uh, just to add on a little bit to what Karen was saying about uh, the run on Sunday, we've actually expanded the online registration. Actually, it's going to go up until 8 a.m. Friday morning. So they are expanding for more folks to be able to go online to register so that they are trying to have as few people as possible registering on site on Sunday so they can focus on more of the setup and getting everything going on Sunday. Uh, I attended that meeting last night for the Education Association, uh, Lisa and I. Um, they are excited with the fact that they are able to partner with the schools and, and actually using some of the funds they raised to give back to the school with helping to expand some technology training for, for our teachers. Uh, they mentioned about um, Tony coming to them talking about the possible uh, land acquisition and where that didn't work out, but they were very pleased the fact that now the schools look to uh, to them to ask for those type of things and where that potential that um, opportunity didn't work out but they were excited at the fact that now they actually get looked to for those type of things so they are looking for again to continue ways to be involved with uh, with the schools and and give back uh, and using the funds there to be able to do those type of things they spoke a little bit about the uh, the does the teacher that are the student super grants uh, that uh, if I remember, Ms. Ashahid is already trying to uh, apply for all the money that they have from the super grants, but they are they are encouraging for for other schools to come up with some projects to. Was uh, it's about forty four by forty thousand dollars that they have uh, available for for grants, which again uh, I encourage all the other principals and other faculty members in the schools to. Uh, come up with some plans really quick because Ms. Ajahid has has plans for $40,000 worth of projects at MEH. So I would encourage that. But they, uh, they're doing a lot right now with, uh, with those things. Um, and then just finally for me on a, a bit of a personal note, and it's kind of education related, um, uh, last evening a, my, I would say, mentor um, passed away last night. Um, Roberta Rickers is her name. She has been a mentor of me since I was probably seven or eight years old of going to my first summer reading program. She was the librarian and in the uh, town that I grew up in, but she also was a teacher long before that, before retiring from that and becoming the librarian. Uh, she is, I would say, the person who is most responsible for my civic involvement as well as love of politics of taking me to my first event uh, down to Richmond uh, during the summer reading program with uh, then uh, First Lady Virgin Linda Robb was First Lady and she was reading to a big group of students down to the State Library and that was my first actual involvement of going to something that was where somebody political was speaking at. Uh, and she has been involved with um, education her entire life and that there's not a person, not only in the town that I that we live in, but the entire county that she has not done a lot for of 
students going to the library with research and she would take the time of 20, 30 minutes of going and walking around and looking for the books for students that they may need for, for projects. So she played a huge role in those things. And oh, it was a sad to hear that last night as she had been sick for a while and I thankfully had many opportunities to go get home to see her. And then while she was in the hospital in Richmond, because of some school board related things during the general assembly session earlier this year, I got opportunities to visit with her um, during that time as well. But uh, it would, so it's a, it was a sad, but she's definitely in a much better place right now. And, and, and I am very thankful for what she was, what, what she did for me of helping me to become the, the outstanding, fine, young, specific person that I am today. <laughs> <laughs> oh, thank you for that. That's a great story. That's a great story. Mr. Lawrence, have you things to share? Uh, thank you. Uh, just a couple things. First, Zach is, is following in Maeve's very able footsteps. He wanted to go through every item on the agenda before the meeting tonight, which A, I think was great, and B, also helped me focus on, you know, as I was going through and talking with him, especially some of the policies on, you know, e-cigarettes and other things, I, you know, focused on them differently after having talked to him. So I think that's, that's absolutely fantastic. Um, speaking of Maeve, update from her mom, who unfortunately is also named Maureen McDonald, so she's glad the trial's over. Um, uh, she said Maeve is already thinking about running for something at UVA as a freshman, so big, big shocker there. Uh, as Tony said, the, uh, the Falls Church Elementary PTA voted you know, a couple hours ago to advocate for the referendum, which was, was great. Hopefully tomorrow the... Uh, the high school PTA will meet and, and we're hoping they will vote as well. Uh, Tony has a great fact sheet that she's been feverishly working on with John Brett and I think that got circulated to everybody. Uh, despite August, the George Mason Steering Committee has continued to meet almost every week and Susan's been there and Justin's been there and others have, have shown up at, at other times as well. And, and I think we're making progress, so that's that's a good thing, but still, it wasn't, uh, it wasn't quiet. Uh, next week is the first gifted and talented meeting of the year, so nothing to report there. And tomorrow, following up on Mount Daniel, I'll be meeting with um, John Faust, Supervisor Faust's office, to talk to his staff just to brief them, bring them up to speed on Mount Daniel, also where the GM process stands, since we might be looking at you know, neighboring properties. Um, and I'll also meet with uh, school board member Janie Strauss, who's the, the Drainsville school board member, just to let her know since obviously Mount Daniel sits in the middle of her district and I've spoken to her before. She's very supportive and she appreciates, you know, knowing what's going on, even if it's not her school. So, thank you. Thank you very much. Yes, Mr. Witzel. All right, let's see if we can get up by 10. Um, so <laughs> I don't really have much, but I just want to say that I, I have been in communication, yeah, okay. I've been in communication with a lot of friends that have gone off to college and I've just been hearing all these incredible things about how well prepared they are and how they're like surpassing all of their fellow students and just doing incredible work and they're especially writing and just so I'd like to just applaud the system and it's just we do such, you know, you all do such great work and all the teachers at, um, at our FCCPS and everyone who works with uh, the schools and it just, it's just an incredible program. I'm so glad to be a part of it. So. Thanks to everyone involved. Thank you. That's great. That's just great. I love to hear that our, our kids go off to other places and find that they really are well prepared. That's awesome. Um, just a couple things. Um, first, we do have a referendum coming to the ballot uh, on Election Day in November with regard to financing the expansion and modernization of Mount Daniel School. If you're a member of the community and you need information, about that, there are a lot of ways you can get it. Um, you can go to a PTA meeting. You can go to the fall festival. The CBC is having a booth. Uh, a lot of folks will be there through the entire day this um, Saturday with flyers of information. We'll be able to answer your questions. You can send your uh, question to any school board member or to our superintendent, and we'll get them answered for you. And if you will just stay tuned, I think there will be uh, other opportunities, uh, forums and town halls throughout the fall. If you'd like to get involved in helping advocate, then uh, I think if you talk to your PTA leader, 
um, they'll be able to connect you up with someone. I think that also, um, as individuals, not on behalf of the board, uh, John Lawrence and Lawrence Webb are also engaged in that effort, and you could contact them as private citizens, and they would be happy to help you. Um, so that's a, a big thing for us to decide as a community um, this coming fall. Uh, to John's point, the George Mason, Mary Ellen Henderson Steering Committee did continue to meet throughout the summer and make progress on test fitting schools to answer the key question, which is, can we have schools and athletic facilities that are appropriate to our community and our kids and still have 30% of our land for commercial development to create revenue streams? And the answer to that appears to be resoundingly yes. Um, and we are continuing then now uh, on the next steps of the path to collect information to provide later in the year to start a community visioning session about what that land and that school will be about. Um, we do have our next meeting this Thursday morning at 7.30 in the morning at Central Office. No, it's, at, it's, it's in the Dogwood Room. Right. In the Dogwood Room downstairs here. It's a public meeting. Everybody's invited to attend. Um, our uh, a good friend and counselor Tom Horn keeps minutes for us. Those are posted on the city's website. They're posted on the school's website. So it, it, there's a lot of uh, opportunity to find out what that committee's up to. So, um, and if once again, if you have questions, feel free to email me or to email John Lawrence or, or Dr. Jones about that particular thing. Um, with that, I think the the last thing that we have is um, yes. Sorry. Well, you you're the cause. Um, there is, on the referendum, there actually is one, um, one public forum already set up. It just, I got told about it yesterday. Um, on October 2nd, there'll be a meeting, I believe, at the American Legion Hall that is going to be co-hosted co by, I believe, um, the American Legion, the CBC, and possibly both the, uh, the Democratic and uh, Republican parties. But there is something set up for October 2nd. We'll circulate more details as soon as we have them. Thanks. Okay, so now uh, the next and final thing is the approval of minutes. We have minutes from July 8th, July 15, and uh, July 22 this evening. And uh, uh, if no one objects, then I'm going to ask them to be approved by unanimous consent. Seeing no objections, uh, we have approved these meetings by unanimous consent. Uh, if there's nothing else, we'll adjourn for the evening. Anyone else? All right, thank you everybody and welcome back. <laughs>